here. This is our first more or less internal IPV webinar to African peace topics. And I'm very happy that with the big help of our African colleagues and friends, we could arrange it. First of all, I would wish you all the best health and maybe a little bit more peace for the year 2021. I, I think for all of us, it is really a challenging year, not only because of Corona and the consequences, but for IPB also in the preparation of our World Congress in Barcelona in October. Uh, the webinar will be, we will have in the beginning four speeches. Three of the speakers are with us now and hopefully the fourth will join uh, in the next minutes. And then we have the possibility for a general discussion, but we also should have a discussion about the next step, how we are developing our IPV work related to peace in and with Africa, what could be the next steps and how we can enlarge our networking in Africa. So it should be on one side, a content oriented discussion, but on the other side, also a little bit a strategic discussion, how we are developing the IPB work in this big and for many of us quite unknown continent. Uh, the first speaker on our agenda would be Kwaka Adai, but he is not with us up to now. I hope he will join soon. So hope I hope I can ask Cyril to start with her speech and to be the first speaker. Cyril is from Cameroon and she is from a human rights organization and called NDH, Nouveau Droit Nom, and I will give the floor to her for the first introduction. So well, I'm happy that you could join us, that you are again with us, and the floor is to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rena. Thank you very much, all of you. Happy New Year. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, you asked me to, to, to give an introduction of the need of, uh, the need of peace in uh, Cameroon, but generally in Central Africa and also a view on Sahel, on the Sahel part of the, of the Africa. So uh, let me start by, start by the biggest one. What is the Sahel? The Sahel is a whole part of Africa taking charge, Niger, Mali, um, Burkina Faso, yes, and Mauritania, as you know. Chad is sharing a large border with Cameroon in the north, north and extreme north of Cameroon. So, and including Lac Chad. As, as you know, all this Sahel re region is under threat of jihadist terrorism. So all the whole part of Cameroon with Nigeria is under threat of Boko Haram. So they have a base in Nigeria, but the incursion and attack happening in Cameroon in the extreme north region of, uh, of our country. So there we, have, we regularly have uh, kamikaze attack. We have uh, oppression from Boko Haram when they need um, to, to have uh, goods, to have uh, animals, to have all of this, the chapter, the, 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 there are many attacks there. Why? That is why women of Cameroon put many efforts, military efforts there in the extreme north region to, 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 to block or to limit the, the, the establishment of Boko Haram in the zone. After saying this concerning the Sahel, the Lac Chad, the northern part of the Cameroon. Now I'm coming down a bit to the border with uh, Central African Republic. As you know, Cameroon is also sharing a large border with, with the Central African Republic. And at this time, the, the coming back, what, uh, what, how can I put it? The coming back of a rebel, a non-state actor, 
in uh, Central African Re Republic is putting a huge threat on Cameroon, on peace in Cameroon. Because as you know, the, the border there is very, it's very, um, people can cross this way and, and another way very easily because it's just a, a road. So when we have uh, the situation since three months where they, there is no more uh, real stability in Central African Republic, we have many refugees coming from, 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 from there. So we, we, we're dealing with uh, community conflict. Most uh, community don't really accept the situation and also you have this situation of, um, of poverty, of, uh, of uh, insecurity uh, happening. We also facing in this part east region of Cameroon because it's the region that is really near uh, Central Africa. We have sometimes attack attacked from that rebels and non non state uh, combatant. So Cameroon army are also engaged in this part of uh, of the country with the the situation from the Central African Republic. Now another. Another uh, 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 head, another front of conflict in Cameroon is it in the west region. We have uh, the conflict in the in the anglophone region. Anglophone region are in the west part in the of the country. Is the northwest and southwest. Now we can also talk about west region because the west region is limitrophe. Uh, to to anglophone re region, if you want to speak about francophone or anglophone, but the conflict now is very inside this three region because they are very the like the the, the last attack was in west region, like attack from from separatist combatants. So as you know, in this part of the country. Uh, socio-political uh, uh, revendication leave place to to armed conflict to an armed conflict there. So since two years now, there are separatist combatants uh, who are who are uh, using different type of arm and different arm of war method to to put threat on. Cameroonian and also on government. So uh, uh, Cameroon army are also engaged, very engaged in that part of the country. So you realize that the conflict, we are really in the conflict. So the need in, in any part of the country is not good. Now, if you come back from this like armed conflict, so open conflict, you also have this conflict all over the country, conflict about governance, bad governance, conflict of, of public um, freedoms, conflict of human rights, because as you know, we have a um, uh, uh, government on place about 38 years. So you can imagine uh, the repression, the force using when we talk about human rights, when we talk about freedom, when we talk about uh, uh, alternance when we talk about power in the country. But what we can also uh, say about the, the conflict precisely in the Anglophone region is the, 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 the change, the change of, of the types of arms used there. At the beginning of, uh, of the armed conflict, it was like we are seeing like traditional arms, like artisanal arms, but more uh, since since sometimes we realize that they are now more sophisticated one they are using for like bomb like automatic one like, i don't know different names uh pekadis akadis so really <laughs> war arms so we realize that since the time is going the situation become more more difficult more was the the, the the talking about peace become more 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 difficult in the field. So now uh, we, we live with a regular attack on, on, on civilian population. 
now our 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 um, our preoccupation is about civilian we still ask them since three years now can you can you put aside women and children can we protect civilian in this in this world in what in what you're happening but unfortunately it's like they're using this uh, vulnerable people as as arm of of war in what they are doing you can see images of women caught neck caught with with machete with all kind of you can see uh, children use as soldier even in uh, in the northern part of the Cameroon because Boko Haram are also recruiting um, in 2013 like this when Boko Haram started in our country uh, government like say that maybe with uh, just military with arm with all the good deployment we, we, we can have and military spending come on with we we come out with Accept that you can't just have military response on this kind of situation, but yet a military spending of Cameroon explodes because of all these different uh, 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 situation, all these challenge, security challenge, all over all over the country. Uh, I don't know what is the time, but <laughs> okay, so. You can see after what I just said that the challenge is very is very important here in Cameroon and in Central Africa because we are in Cameroon is like a how can you say a a, a board where we have many other uh, actors uh, uh, aside so everything is happening in Cameroon many things will happen also in other countries and what is happening in other countries also influence the situation in Cameroon but even inside inside now is very the tension are very 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 hard political tension socio-economic all attention in the in the in the country uh, there is no position when people want to 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 demonstrate they are arrest and detain without trial there are many people now in custody because just arbitrary arrest and detention in uh, in all this uh, there the, there is like a foolish use of lethal arm in uh, in the country by by soldiers by army by all people who who, who have uniform it's like it's just the force if you don't do what we want as they ask you to do they use force so that creates a very lack of confidence a situation of tension, very high tension now in the in the country and that is not is not good it's not good that's why we are saying that they really need peace really need of how can we talk about this because even in social media now there's this thing of tribalism i don't know where this is coming from but like this one day since two years now, the tension, the politicians use this as arm between citizens. So now all our, polit our, our politics, to just say something, it becomes a problem. It becomes, this is Bamileke, this is Betty, this is, this is. So we are, either we are going very, very, very down. The threat is very high on, on, uh, on the peace in Cameroon globally. That is a small and happy introduction I can make on Cameroon, Central Africa, and Sahel globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cyril, so much for this picture of a part of Africa. I think it is very helpful for understanding the situation in the country and in the surrounding area. And I think we will come back when we got a more full picture of African problems, then we will come back to you and to the discussion. And I personally have some questions to you, but the next speaker is Kraku Adai. He's an old friend of IPB. He's a member of the council. And he is in the organization, even chairing the organization of Millennium Development Institute. 
Uh, Quaco, the floor is to you. I'm happy that you could make it and that you are with us today. Quaco, the floor is to you. You have to unmute yourself and then you can start. Yeah. Okay. Is it is it okay now? Great. I'm having some difficulty trying to upload my data, but let's see. Now I can share. Just one minute. Uh, in case I'm not, I may have to let you, uh, maybe I have to send you a mail so you can upload it from your end. But maybe you'll start speaking. That's maybe the easiest way to do it. I wanted to share, but uh, I'm having some problems with my data. So what I want to do is possibly to send you an email so you can upload it from your end there, if it is possible. Yes. Yep. I'm not too sure whether I sent. I check your email, a scale. I think I send, give it to a scale. Draft. Okay. It's impossible from my screen here, but I'm unable to get. Okay. Okay, so um, so so good 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 afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Adai, and uh, speaking from Ghana. Um, you may have to pardon me from those of you with uh, heavy statistical knowledge. I was trying to do something, and so with this meeting, I needed to put up something for you quickly. Um, so, so I was trying to find out what is a linkage between military spending, corruption and stability um, in the developing world and to look for Africa perspective. Um, so I will be looking for the introduction, literature review methodology, and I will maybe have to jump because some areas may not be interested to you. But if you look at the introduction, um, I'm trying to look at the, the linkages between the variables that I've mentioned. Um, the historical study started so many years back in 2001 by Gupta Dita and Jones and Huston, and somehow uh, the Augusto Ita was in 2012. So uh, the countries with large expenditure, uh, the contribution is important because potentially uh, it does affect peace as we have in Desley and Grosko Sister 2020. So I've tried to define stability corruption and military spending um, with the stability defined as a tendency for government to fall and rise and fall based on various political factors. Um, so I have to jump because you may possibly not need because you, look, you need the actual Africa perspective. The, so if you look at the, the map over there, which, which actually is talking and uh, looking at the perspective of Africa. You're looking at the military spending with the current green, or blue, sorry. 
Then we have the two colors. We have the corruption and then we have stability. And look at it from 1996 to 2018, you would see that anytime there is, there is a rise or the other, there is a corresponding rise of all others. So when corruption is increasing, instability is increasing, which is spending increasing. Which is spending in the foreign, all others are foreign. So, so it tells you a very strong linkage between or among the three variables. So we were trying to find out what is it that is really informing this and to test whether it is true. So I may have to jump, um, to jump the gap, all these are all issues that we may have to refer them when I submit the full draft. Um, further to finally to look at the outcome or the research. Um, So I checked the, I took about 14 countries and I checked also whether the effect of one country, um, if something happens in one country, it will also affect others. So the article will be talking about that. I just tried to pick something for just for this presentation, but the full draft will be there so we can know more details. Um, so when I look at the, the causality test, for example, if you look at the pairwise causality test before the, then the last bit, if you have to jump. Just jump, the next one. Yeah, no, 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 before the findings. So if you look at this one, you see that corruption does not cause military spending which is true. But the, the third one, where we have the asterisks, uh, we have the 0 0.23, the probability, is where we now can find out that military spending actually causes instability. So the lower military spending, the better it is, the higher military spending, the worse the stability situation in the country because it does dovetail into corruption and all other variables. Um, surprisingly, the stability, if you look at the trade, you see that the stability does not cause corruption. Corruption does not also cause stability, and it's true. But the critical one is military spending um, having issues with stability of a state. Um, but combining the two, the actual findings, if you go to the findings finally, which have been a sprint, um, as well in the data that I got, the stability, corruption, and military spending are related. And we have seen that countries with evidence of higher degrees of corruption are more likely to spend heavily on defense outlets. The impact of this expenditure is always and directly felt by public through sovereign debt, corruption, cuts in social services, and instability. And we realize that that one is also a factor in Africa. The causality tests I did explain also are here and I've explained. Now, the conclusion finally, which may interest you, uh, is the outcome support somebody's work. And if you such where expenditure were spent on education, healthcare, and environment, more just could be created with the same funds. If we have to go back to the analysis that I did, uh, which is which I just summarized in the conclusion here and the recommendations. Um, a change in corruption positively impacts on stability, surprisingly, in one of the data, um, which full reading will show uh, in the in the in the in the, in the concession dependence analysis. There, policy measures for reducing corruption can significantly not only improve stability but also outcomes from Africa. Uh, this one also. Um, the causality test did not show this, but the other ones also show this one. The policymakers need to invest more on reducing military spending 
which is an entry point for instability. And by so doing, they will be capitalizing on opportunities for stability, development, and peace. So more or less, um, so that possibly would not confuse a lot of people uh, who may not be interested in the statistical side. Um, these are the findings and the conclusions of the articles I'm trying to write. Thank you. Thank you, Kraku. This is a very interesting report about these relations. Very helpful, I think, for our peace work, but also for our disarmament work. And I hope that this will be also a part of our discussions and activities around the DCOM days this year. So thank you so much. Thank you. The next, the next speaker is coming from Rwanda. It is Innocent Buzore from the Global, in Global Initiative for Environment and Reconciliation. And I think he will also speak about the very, very important and very difficult and dangerous region in Africa. Innocent, the floor is to yeah. you. Thank you so much. Let me start by wishing you a happy new year and uh, say thank you to have uh, this discussion. My name, as you said, um, Innocent Musore. I'm uh, based in Rwanda, Kigali. I work with uh, Global Initiative Environment and Reconciliation. It's a national organization with mission to support the peace building process and development. Yeah, the organization is uh, working with a uh, number of organizations in Great Lakes. So, uh, and uh, let me say, confirm that peace is needed in Africa and the Great Lakes as well as the topic of this discussion. Yeah, I can confirm that we need peace in Africa and the Great Lakes in a special way. The Great Lakes is uh, composed by, let me say, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, and uh, there is a lot of countries, but this is the central. Uh, there is a lot of history of uh, issues of conflict, which took roots uh, from colonial history. There is a lot of conflict related to ethnicity, the near the people are living border. They have issues of conflict related to ethnicity. Yeah, Rwanda is stable now because of uh, the leadership we have, but we are still facing the issue of uh, the effect of genocide against the Tutsi, the 90. 94 genocide against Tutsi, we still have effect on uh, facing the effects of genocide, the genocide, because we have uh, many people participated in the genocide. They are finishing their sentences, they are joining a community. So we need the integration, integration process. At, uh, and we have people coming from uh, Britannies, from DRC, the arm from arm groups who need also reintegration. At a Great Lakes level, in Eastern Congo, our neighbors, there is a lot of conflict, mm -hmm. war and conflict and uh, violence and mass killings, where people, the community having arms, it's, a, it's like a ordinary thing, it's a, it's a, it's a behavior. It became behavior to have guns. Uh, there is a lot of uh, rebel or group of army, hundred and hundred. They are killing people there. They are violating the women. They are putting children in those groups. They are doing mining as uh, one of the resources supporting them. There is some uh, hidden agenda from outside to support them. There is a, it's a worse situation there. So in Rwanda, we are affected with them because if your neighbor has an issue, also you are affected. We are affected with the violence from uh, DRC. There is a lot of, a lot of uh, violence, high violence. There is a uh, different reports from UN, from uh, government, from media showing if nothing, done, the second genocide can be 
uh, happen in the Greek Lakes again after the genocide against Tutsi 94 here in Rwanda. So uh, we need peace. We need a voice. We need to increase voice for peace. We need actions. We need uh, to consolidate already what has been done in Rwanda. We need also exchange, interaction, solidarity, communities, civil society organization to increase the voice of peace here in Great Lakes because we are interlinked, we are interconnected. If uh, one country is affected, the other one is affected. We have issues in Burundi, post-election violence. We still have refugees here in Rwanda. So these are challenge we are facing in Great Lakes. So we have uh, to make awareness on uh, positive disarmament uh, where people can separate it with arms, with guns. Uh, we have to teach people to be, to live together. We have people, we have to teach people to live together in harmony, in peace. You know, our father Mandela said, if people have been taught to kill or to hate and hate, meaning that can be uh, educated to love and love, we still have opportunity to live together if we invest in peace. If we sit in peace, if we increase our voice together, if we cooperate together uh, and to, to, to increase our voice together and to partner for the, 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 this cause of peace in Great Lakes because it's very, the situation in Eastern Congo, uh, South Kivu, there is high and high massive killing, people are dying, people are violated, women are violated, uh, so we need peace. So how we are in uh, talking with other organizations in Great Lakes because we are living in the same situation, how we can establish a coalition to increase our peace of civil society organization, actors of this region, where we can influence peace, we can influence our government, we can advocate our government to to talk together, to cooperate, uh, to allow peace, and uh, even campaigning for the African Union uh, strategies on silencing guns. So we, we want or we need actions to silencing gun in Eastern Congo. We want voice uh, to break the silence of violence to break the ethnicity, violence, and war, and conflict. We want peace, we want voice, not only for us Africans, all over the world. We have to engage other people, influential institutions in the world to silence in Ghana in Eastern Congo. Because people are dying, people are suffering, people are, are their villages, they are in the war, they, are, they, are, they have guns, like uh, they buy guns like uh, buying uh, any needs. I was talking with someone from there, he was uh, sharing me the experience. Like even dowry in, in, uh, in nowadays, the, the communities are sharing guns in dowry when they are, they are married, they can, brought, they can bring uh, guns. You see how, how things are uh, very worse. So we need voice to tell people to be separated with guns, to be separated with, uh, to overcome those conflicts. But we need actions as civil society organizations, cooperating with partners and our government and implementing, enforcing laws of disarmament in the, the Great Lakes. And even looking the study, we can even conduct the study, analyzing the, the issues, how we are still affected by colonial because the ethnic, ethnicity is brought in from, let me say, outside our region. Because before, the experience showed that the community lived together, before colonial period. Uh, so we have, we have duties to see the peace in Great Lakes. Thank you.
so much. Thank you, Innocent, for this highly interesting picture of another very important region in Africa, showing a little bit the positive developments in Rwanda, but the big problem with some of the surrounding countries and the need for next peace steps and above all for peace actions. And I think we will come back to the point of actions in our discussion. The final speaker is again from Ghana. It is Joseph Donku from the Global Peace Association of Ghana. Joseph, you are heavily welcome. I will give the floor to you now. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Rena. And I extend my warm greetings to everyone out there, including even wishing them a happy new year as well. Mr. Reyna, I think today's uh, platform is very, very good and charged, considering the, the, the various speakers' presentations. Uh, starting from my sister, Cyril, you realize she spoke a lot with regards to what is happening in Cameroon, as well as the entire Central African uh, sub-region, including even the Sahel. The same way my good friend, Koko Adai from Ghana, also gave a very deep insight with regards to what is trending in Africa, most especially on what is called uh, uh, corruption and its impact on Africa. Then Innocent just spoke regarding uh, what is called the ethnocentric politics ongoing in Rwanda, as well as the destabilization of the peace process by the rebels. Mr. Reyna, as I intimated earlier on in our last meeting, yeah, Africa is interconnected. The various countries in Africa is interconnected. And for us to sustain the peace process in Africa, it's not an individual country's fight or an individual organization's battle, but it's a battle that has to come with a collective force. A battle that has to come with a collective force. I remember during the colonial, colonial era, when Osajibu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, our first president of this country, was fighting for the independence of Ghana he said, and I re echoed, that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked up to the total liberation of the entire African continent. It clearly states and defines that Africa lives on interconnection. For that matter, when it comes to the question of peace, we, the civil societal organizations, must be up and doing. We must begin coming together to have a very loud voice. Like my brother uh, Innocent just said, if the voice is not loud, they will not listen. How can the voice be loud? The voice will only be loud when we give presentations. And after that, there's resolutions, there is petitions to the various authorities to the various authorities, the governments, the UN uh, stakeholders in the, in the, in the uh, sub-region as well as the countries, et cetera, et cetera. The African Union, they cannot manage the peace process of Africa alone as governments because they both have their political interests. We represent the society, the peoples of the world, the people of the continent. And for that matter, not until we make a decisive decision, Africa is not going to go well. 
Currently, as we speak in Ghana, there is a litigation after election, of which is perfect. That one, I 100% I welcome it. A litigation that has to go through the due process, but not a litigation where ravages, destructions of properties and life should be carried on, of which that was the initial attempt. And finally, they then decided to resort to uh, 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 the uh, due process as it were court. Yeah. Ms. Rina, politics in Africa has all the time been ethnocentrism. It has all the time been uh, uh, tri tribalistic. And it is we, the civil societies, who must rise up to this occasion. Politics in our various countries, and for that matter, the entire African continent, leads to the formation of these militant groups. Because at the end of the day, they will not live up to their words, their promises. So this, the, the, those who are you know, shallow-minded will decide to go and form these militant groups to destabilize the peace process of the continent. How many of us are educated here in Africa? It is the, the, minor, the minute part. The larger part of the population of Africa is non-educated. And even if they are educated, they are semi. They are semi-educated. And for that matter, we need to do what is called uh, 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 the orientational work. We need to orient them towards the need for the sustenance of our peace process in Africa. We can only do this when we decide that, oh, let's zone ourselves. We have the West African subregion. We have the East African subregion. We have the Central African subregion. We have the South African subregion. We have, we have the uh, Northern African subregions coming together to form the regional network itself. When we have all these in place, it means that we have the voices to be heard by governments and uh, those state actors. And the world will also listen to us at large. We can plan and plan well the direction of the peace process. But when it comes to an individual organization, you can do nothing. They can cripple you. Governments can silence you. I remember for the past three years, the African Union will always emphasize on silencing the gun. Mr. Reyna, how on earth could you have a gun down for someone to come and attack you and you said you silenced the gun? So I will prefer the, the abolition of the possession and the proliferation of illicit arms in the African continent. I will prefer that. If you don't have it at all, it means that you are not ready to even fire anything against anybody. I prefer we abolish it. And in abolishing it, government would never concur until we come together as civil societal peace organizations advocating for it, mounting platforms upon platforms, inviting and uh, doing exchange programs together, presenting petitions. That is where they can also listen to us. And that is where they will take into consideration. Otherwise, the peace process of Africa is going to be derailed. So I think we must as well redefine what is called democracy and politics in Africa. We must look into how best to redefine democracy and politics in Africa. And in fact, it's a very broad topic that we need to delve more into it. We also defy our systems. We, build, we pretend we build the systems down, and at the end of the day, we abuse the systems such that the systems are not working. And if we are to build systems and allow the systems to work, definitely there will be a, a peaceful atmosphere. But systems in Africa are not working. It is the civil societies who can advocate for it to work. And here we are, civil, most civil societies are in close alliance with 
the various political parties, which is not helpful. Which is not helpful as far as, far as peace building is concerned. We must stay neutral. And if we're able to do that, then we can move ahead. We must as well uh, be in most of the, the leaderships, most of the leaders, we elect them into office, become power drunk, and as soon as they come, they decide, they decide to change certain things. And for that matter, we end up killing ourselves and fighting ourselves. So Ms. Serena, I think these are the areas if we are to look at is going to help build a sustainable peace in Africa. I'm not talking about Ghana. I'm not talking about West Africa alone, but I'm talking about the generality of Africa. Thank you so much for the audience granted me. Joseph, thank you so much for this highly interesting introduction and speech, speech mentioning highly interesting points like cooperation, like education, like the fight for democracy and re-establishing new coalitions for peace in Africa and in the different regions of Africa. Thank all of the four speakers. I think this was absolutely, I think what we have expected to get a part of an overview about the situation in Africa by the speakers. And now I would like to open the floor with two words of introduction. First point is, when you are looking to the participants, and I'm saying this also in the direction of our African colleagues, we have a very international audience. So we have Asian participants, we have US participants, European participants, so we can hopefully have a very interesting international exchange and also coming questions from very different parts of the world to you. And the second, before we start, my colleague Jean reminds me that he wants to make a Zoom group photo. And I hope that is okay for every one of you. Then Jean, the floor is to you. And I can see that you are changing your seats. And Jean, is it okay? Can we make the photo now? Yeah. yeah but, uh, so any, anyone, everyone who can turn your cameras on, please do so. Uh, even just for a quick second here. Uh, I'll wait a minute more just in case anyone else. Uh, I know Adai, you had your, your camera on earlier. Maybe you can turn it on again just very quickly for us. Uh, those who are raising their hands, I see Bina and Emma. Um, perhaps you can put it down just for a second and then raise it again afterwards. I'll make sure that we remember your hands were raised. No problem. <laughs> I have Bina and Emma on my list. No problem. Okay, there we go. It's looking like we have a really great group photo here. Uh, we will be publishing this on social media, if that's okay with everyone. And if so, then I will just count down. Three, two, one, smile. And I think that should do it. Give me one second here quick just to check and make sure everything looks all right. And it does, uh, except Alain. Uh, we have you turning away from the camera at the last second there. Maybe we can try just one more time quick. Okay. Uh, don't want to take too much time for this, but uh, so just one more countdown. Three, two, one, smile. And there we go. That sh I think between those two pictures, that should do it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gene, for doing that. And I think you can see it on our social media activities during the next days. So the first on my list I saw is Emily and then Bina and then Jenny. So Emily, the floor is to you. Me? Yes, you. Great. Sorry, I thought I heard Emily and was trying to work out if there yeah. was. Hi, um, thank you so much. That was a really interesting um, set of talks and, I, um, and a very interesting sort of insight into a number of different regions. Um, my sort of main question was, uh primarily to joseph but then to like our other speakers as well like we we talked about um you talked about networks and building networks within africa for peace and the need to sort of be large a larger movement than sort of one or two civil society organizations is there a um there's a how do you see that fitting into sort of the wider role obviously these structures that create 
the, the systems of instability are not unique to Africa and it's not an African problem that needs to be solved sort of so just on the continent. So how do you see the sort of networks internationally working into, into supporting um, peace and, and stability in the, in the continent? So I have two more on my list. This is Jenny and Eng Kian. And my suggestion is I will give the next three speakers the floor. And then we are coming back to our African speakers and they may maybe make a short note and then they answer the different questions. Rainer, can we also include Bina in that? She has Bina is the next one. Bina is number two. Yeah. Bina, the floor is to you. So the list, the list is Bina, Jenny, and Eng Kian. And then I will give the word again back to our African colleagues. Bina. Yeah, first of all, Cyril, Sister Cyril, Innocent, uh, Adai, Joseph, you were brilliant. All of you actually brought home so much to the IPB family. Um, my name is Bina Nepram. I'm from uh, an indigenous region of Manipur in Northeast of India, currently living in exile, but I am a board member of IPB. And it's wonderful that this is the first ever Africa meeting. And I'm so thrilled to hear all your voices. Thank you for your courage and we are with you in your struggles. Uh, for me, it's, in, it's about, so it's about more about just to welcome and just to know how we are with you in this solidarity, but also to know that how our lives are so interconnected. You talked about how colonial rule have divided this. I have met friends from Rwanda, from Congo, from different parts of Africa, and the, the same story that we see in Asia are the same story of colonization, repression, and how our corrupt politicians are putting this divide and rule of ethnicities. In India, it's Hindu Muslim. Uh, and all these divides are coming up where it is perpetrated more by an infusion of arms trade coming from the global north. So this is, as, as I said, the UN permanent members of the UN Security Council produces 88% of the world's weapons. And it is this weapons which is going to make us fight. So for me, my suggestion to IPB is, yes, we focus a lot on nuclear weapons, but this, all our African colleagues today have shared how small arms and light weapons are actually killing each other every day. You can buy an AK-47 for the price of a chicken in many parts of Africa, and so too in India. A bullet costs 10 cents. A weapon costs $100. So these are the problems that we've got to collectively as IPB family, got to support our African colleagues. And my final point is, in as much as we are worried, I think there's a lot that Africa is teaching us. You know, we, we had such stalled leaders like Nelson Mandela who forged their will and they struggled and taught the world. Then we have women leaders. Rwanda has more than the highest number of women parliamentarians in the world is in Rwanda, innocent. And we are so, so much inspired by that. So I think there are these global resolutions like 1325, which we can take on and then help each other. But as I said, so at the women in decision-making, Sister Cyril has talked brilliantly about it and how do we ensure all of us today have spoken about how there's the importance and the need to get women in decision-making. And the other issue of deepening democracy. This is so important. I am from a country and in exile because of an authoritarian dictatorship right now, which is ruling India under the Modi regime. And so we have to really see how to can claim our, our democracies back. And it has to be done in a very indigenous way. We can look up to the West, we can look out to the UN, but the UN is as good as what its member countries it's to be. So I think we have to create indigenous ways of conflict resolution, indigenous ways of peace. And we just want to say my solidarity to all. So this is, this is just a footnote to all your brilliant speeches. Thank you. And we are with you and work together this year and, and more power to all of us. Thank you, Bina. And the next one is Jenny. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. I'm Jenny. Uh, I'm on the IPB Council from Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Uh, I hope that people have heard of that. I've been scratching my head how to introduce myself. Do I say I'm from the UK, from Britain? <laughs> um, I have an identity crisis here. Um, this is a, an extremely interesting discussion that's throwing up a lot of questions, and I want to raise another couple of questions. I want to know how the speakers see development fitting in here, because um, you talk about terrorism, you talk about militant groups, you talk about uh, militarization in the villages. 
uh, you know, to what extent could this be addressed through uh, job creation, through training, uh, through uh, better roads, electricity, um, and so on. Um, and uh, the second question that I have um, is about the role, nobody's mentioned the role of UN peacekeeping forces. So um, I'd like to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And hopefully we can solve your identity crisis during the year. <laughs> Okay, so the next speaker, before I will give the floor again to our African colleagues, is Eng Sakya. Uh, can I speak now? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate our uh, African colleagues for presenting, making uh, eye-opening presentations on various issues. Uh, during the presentations, uh, a mention was made about uh, decolonization which is almost over, and uh, about uh, uh, the uh, sustainable peace. In this connection, I was wondering, uh, what is the view of our colleagues, of our African colleagues regarding Western Sahara? It was an issue, I think, uh, uh, very high on the agenda in the 1970s, early 1980s, and then uh, we didn't know what was happening. Can you hear me? Yes, Western, Western Sahara. And I was wondering whether the African Union has taken up this issue, especially after the understanding between the US and Morocco concerning the status of Western Sahara. I haven't read, I haven't uh, heard anything, uh, any reaction from our uh, African countries. So I was wondering whether this still is uh, uh, an issue high on the agenda or not whether it is part of the decolonization process and whether it would affect sustainable peace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eng Sekian. And I think we are coming back now to our African colleagues and I will, would like to do it vice versa. So in this case, starting with Joseph and then to Innocent uh, Kwaku and then at the end Cyril. And, Maybe you can try to answer your questions in a time not longer than five minutes that we have a little bit of chance to continue our discussion. The floor is to you, Joseph. Yeah, Mr. Rina, thank you very much for the audience granted me again. Uh, as we speak, the road is clear. We are looking at establishing systems which should be solely independent. The systems must operate on their own. With that, there wouldn't be agitations. There wouldn't be uh, 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 grievances. There wouldn't be, let's go and form militant groups. So when we are able to establish systems and allow the systems to operate on its own, that means that we are making a headway as far as peace process is concerned. Then when you look at the issue of, uh, there's a, a UN peacekeeping. Yes, UN peacekeeping is a military, uh, and we are supposed to dialogue over issues. We cannot get peace from uh, the, 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 the gun or the arms. We can only have peace when the mouth and mouth is able to meet. We can have peace when we are able to identify where exactly the issue is coming from, then we can also address it because it is out of the mindset of the people that was are being derived. So it is through the mindset of the people that wars can be prevented. So when we're able to do all these, then automatically we can have our peace. We can also have the way of training and equipping our people, the larger population who are non-educated, let's have them skill developed. They should have something doing. And once they have something doing, ending their estimate, 
then there wouldn't be issue the issue of the formation of militant groups or rebels. We can as well have in place where we can civil societies can be charging the African Union to do what is right. And what is right is what the people demands, that what the people are yearning for. And the demands of the people is only peace, of which without peace, nothing is achievable. Without peace, there is no progress in life. Without peace, there's no life. So we need as civil societal organizations to charge our people, to charge the governments of the day. And governments of the day cannot be only charged by an individual organization, no. If indeed we are representing the society, if indeed we are championing the cause of peace, we have to stand and stand firm. We need to collaborate with each other as civil societal peace organizations to ensure that we are able to achieve our goal. And the ultimate goal is sustainable peace and development. That is what I, I am determined for. And I think that is what the IPB also stands for. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, so, thank you so much. And Innocent is the next. Yeah. Thank you uh, again for giving me the floor. Just I will uh, answer in a few ways, say based on uh, the comment or the topic raised by colleagues. And I thank you for your for your insight. Thank you. Uh, let me say the civil society is needed. Uh, they organize the having platform or forums of discussions or increasing voice is needed here in Great Lakes, where we will talk the issues affect the communities, how guns or weapons are disseminated, uh, people are, have, are having it and buying it. So we need a platform where we can discuss and civil society represents community, advocate for community. So it's needed to have those platform here uh, where we can have colleagues from different uh, countries to, to, to be included. And I can say that the most affected people with this conflict and violence, they are women. So here in Rwanda, we have an experience where women are involved in leadership and it's contributing a lot, not only in governance, even in peacekeeping missions, we have women. And the women, they know, they know the, the cost of peace, the cost of stability. So in, through this platform, we can even share the experience of Rwanda, how to increase the, vo the voice of women, how brothers or colleagues, they can learn from our experience. They can learn how to engage women, how to involve women in a peace process or peace consolidation. Uh, we can also have, we can discuss on numbers, policies and strategies to consolidate peace, but which is not having not yet implemented have been agree with government, UN, African uh, Initiative, Great Lakes. There is a lot of policies and strategies, but the implementation of it is a big, big issue. So having big voice, I think we can push to implement those policies. Some of it's silencing guns, it's a disarmament, it uh, speak and uh, breaking the silence around the violence of women and uh, girls and children affected by uh, conflict in Eastern Congo and its effect on the region. And uh, preventing the future violence, like genocide in Eastern Congo, where people are dying. And also uh, recruiting young children in those armed groups and also discussing of the role of external institution in supporting those movements. 
because they have support. They have mining and they have client. So we have to say something, to uh, speak. We have to show where the, the treat of peace is coming. The root causes. And uh, related to colonial, the conflict, they, 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 they name it ethnicity conflict, but there is an, a behind a hide agenda. So in our voice together, I think it can have an impact uh, to consolidate peace and uh, disarmament in Great Lakes. So we need, let me say it again, we need action, we need a platform for exchange experience. Uh, like Rwanda, we have a lot of work done and we are open to share with our colleagues because they, have, they, are, they are suffering affect us as human, as neighbor, as country, as development partner. Thank you, Innocent, thank and you. thank you so much. And the next one is Kwaku. The floor is to you. OK. Um, can you hear me now? Wonderful. Right. Uh, if you look at what I may be submitting to the Secretariat to publish, the variables that inform instability um, actually include corruption and military spending. Um, I'm also even seeing that the military spending from the US is equally, and the big countries, is equally perpetuating the instability across the world, the developing world, so to speak. Because that is the focus of my research. And so uh, to answer the question that was asked by one of the questionnaires, the, the two variables include the many other variables that affect instability across the developing world. We need to work on corruption, and we need to work on military spending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the final speaker in this first round of question and answers is Cyril. The floor is to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the floor. Uh, what can I add? What can I add? I can add that uh, from what Innocent uh, uh, just said, I think that we need a network, a whole network, not a network just from African actors, because we need your support. We need you to know what is happening and to, to, to get our voice heard uh, at international level, at, at other level, because the challenge in our country in Africa now is to, is to lobby and plead in all area where we are talking about states, where we are talking about civil society space. Because if in Rwanda, like I see, civil uh, society have space, here in Central Africa and in Cameroon, we are fighting to keep our space. We are fighting to speak uh, in our country. Since three years now, I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not possible for me to demonstrate, it's not possible for me to hold a public meeting in Cameroon. Remember, in 2018, I sent to you uh, a, a decision on all of this from, from uh, the Ministry of uh, Interior on like, I don't have authorization to, 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 to have public meeting in, Cam in Cameroon because I'm talking about human rights. You see that we need all of us to talk about the civil society space because some so in some part we, we don't have it. They, 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 they want to control and to keep this civil society space in their hand. When you talk about critic, when you talk about what they don't want to understand, you become a complotist, you become, what did I say to me? They say that I'm, I'm, an, I'm an spy from uh, international community to destroy uh, Cameroon. So you see that it's the challenge are very high. So that is for me, the network can't be just network for African actors. For me, network has to be an open network to really to talk about the civil society voice 
civil society space in our country and all over the world. That makes me enter in another uh, situation. We, I also think that we need to look, up, to look about this fight against terrorism. It's like uh, government eyes uh, I use it as a, a justification, as a good way to, to, to violate human rights and to uh, limit uh, civil society space and voice. It's like they, they have some kind of legitimacy to, 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 to limit uh, public uh, freedoms and rights because they are saying that they are fighting against terrorism. This question of definition in all our country, not in Cameroon, even if you, you go to the Sudan manifest, you can be uh, uh, arrest and detain on terrorism uh, infraction. So how can we really um, take a, a state accountable concerning this fight against terrorism? Even in this Boko Haram, there are many people now in custody because they can come here and decide that you collaborate with, with, with Boko Haram and you are arrested, keep there as they want. So, uh, the, and this is a question concerning all national and international community because even this UN, yes, it is a large, a large group, multilateral, and all of this, African Union also. But um, since all these uh, institutions, uh, uh, there are many more uh, state actors there, we have problems with this uh, institution. I remember um, the um, uh, the judge and the, the head of commission of African Union Commission, when there was a massacre here in Cameroon, the, 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 the message he leaves here was not the message of peace for me. It was like a, a support to the state because we were thinking that uh, in, maybe he, 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 maybe he will, he will have had a different position on the situation because we we think that human being must be in the front of what we are doing as African Union as as a, a United uh, Nation. But no, we really need to say is there these people there are they working for for government for state or are they really there and push uh, a human being and population, civil society uh, uh, a challenge, are they pushing this aspect uh, to uh, in, their, in their work? Now, concerning the question on development, yes. Um, in Cameroon, you are still having this uh, Bank Mondial and other actors, all, all this uh, FME uh, fund. They uh, recently they, they agree they have another agreement or another huge amount to give to Cameroon. The situation is that when there is not clear accountability process, where there is no democracy, they are used they, they, they are they are with the corruption and all of this, they are using this money this money for other things, not for what the money is taken. For example, northern part of Cameroon was in 20 in the in the because no we, we we have another strategic national strategic plan is for 10 years. Before that, we we have a strategic plan, national one from uh, from uh, 20 for uh, 2015 to uh, 2020. And in this plan, they decide that northern part of Cameroon is uh, educational. The, it is like education prioritaire. So all money will go there to school, for primary school. But when you, you do an evaluation, there is no school there. And, and, uh, 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 and pourtant, we, money was given mm, uh, from all that institution. So now Camunia have to pay for a money that was not used for what uh, money was given in the uh, to, to the country. So since there is no democracy, since there is no way of asking for accountability, oh, they use it. They 
they, 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 they use it as a one for great, great, great breeding for what they want, even for root. All money give to Cameroon for, there's no root. There's no root, but you can see that European Union give huge amount. I don't know, uh, French people give huge amount, but sometimes I think asking them, why is it that you are giving money? You don't see a result, but you, you are still giving money. Are we really talking about the same thing? That is some uh, some question we are look, looking about. Yeah, I think at the end you mentioned really a very important point, which we should continue discussing. What does it mean, development? And what are the relations with development of the country and foreign support by the big countries of the I world? Know. And who is mainly maybe supporting only corruption? So I, I, have, one, I have one more speaker on my list who raised her hand. And this is Corazon from the Philippines. Cora, the floor is to you. Thank you, uh, Rainer. Um, I just would like to respond to, uh, first I would like to say that a lot of things that I, I heard to, tonight um, is new to me. You know, we hardly get any information, even in the social movement community. Uh, this is, somehow what you'd call a blind spot and uh it's, it's very unfortunate uh that it is so because there are a lot of common grounds uh you know the the development capitalism all this uh, uh responsibility of leadership and all this uh you know uh education uh, denial you know and and people are not getting what they are supposed to be getting in terms of education, food, and opportunities. Um, I don't know whether it is too late to recommend uh, a, a, a webinar or a session for the World Social Forum, given that we might have a bigger audience in, in the World Social Forum and if there is a space to organize one in Africa, uh, maybe uh, define a very specific issue that our friends from Africa might be able to identify and, and for us to support that, uh, the organizing of that webinar. I know that the deadline was last Sunday, but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> The second one, uh, I think particularly for Cyril, um, I am in a discussion with uh, Christine uh, of the No to NATO, uh, and uh, we're thinking of organizing the, the a webinar on militarism, violence against women as a weapon of war. And we're looking for a speaker on Boko Haram. So I wonder if she has gotten in touch with you if not, I would like to get your email address, uh, if you could send that to me. Uh, I'm going to leave my email address in, in the chat box so that you can send me your information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cora, for this uh, speech, because you know this is the next step, I think, of this webinar to go into a more political and content-oriented discussion a little bit more to the next practical steps of our work. You know, I really want to underline that this is the first IPB more or less internal webinar to Africa, which for me is a start point. And I read the very interesting uh, chat mail from Philip, who said this is an important day for IPB. I think I can only underline the sentence. It is an important day for IPB, but it is also a start point. And I think now we have to think about the next development, the next webinar, a webinar which is publicly open, not, a, not only a webinar for the IPB family. And, you know, I only can ask our, our African colleagues to help us developing the next steps. I think we will shortly come together and think about 
the next activities. Let me mention three or four points which I think we should be put on our agenda discussing it. The first one I think many of you mentioned are the question of small guns, small weapons. And I think we should deep, much deeper discuss the question of small weapons, which is not only an African problem, we have, I think, quite the same problem in the minimum in Latin America, but it is a definitely a deep African problem. And maybe we can come to a common webinar and following the common actions and activities, maybe even a common appeal uh, against small weapons as one of the next important steps of our work. The next point, I think, is a question of development. I think as IPB and as critical voices in the world, we need a much deeper discussion about what is development and what is only support of corruption and how are the relations between development and peace and development and disarmament. And then we are definitely have to discuss about the role of the sustainable development goals. I think this is for me also a very important point. I also would like to follow the point of Cyril to have a deeper, very difficult discussion about terrorism. I think this is a very difficult discussion, but we could not avoid the discussion because it is a big problem of many parts of the world. So maybe this is also a very important part for our future world. And I have a fourth point, and these are definitely not all points. I have a fourth point. This is the point of how we can really develop a peace network in Africa, how we can come to much more common activities of many African peace organizations and other organizations, which includes the question of which peace networks exist and how we can work together as peace movement with other social movements, human rights movements, movements for fair trade and others, so movement for uh, overcoming the climate disaster. I think we have a lot of points where we have to discuss how we can develop such a deeper network with, with the main focus on Africa, which is definitely connected to networks in other parts of the world, and I can only say for IPB, IPB is definitely open to help where IPB can help. And these are, for me, some point of reflection, maybe at the beginning of the last round of our discussion. And, you know, I open now the floor for maybe comments for next steps, strategy point, and Maybe we have about half an hour, we can summarize some points and then we definitely will continue working with it. And I'm very happy that our African colleagues are really becoming a more intensive part of the IPV work. That's great. And we should continue this work. And the floor is open to comments. And the first I saw is Gene. Gene, the floor is to you. And then who wants to raise his or her hands or give me a sign, please do it. So uh, I just want to bring into all these lessons that we're getting from this uh, re reminder that IPB is conducting or, or preparing our uh, second World's Peace Congress in Barcelona this October, October 15th to 17th. And we really want to uh, have Africa represented in, in the Congress and in the uh, themes that we are bringing into the Congress. So this is a great first step to help us to to understand how we can bring those in. Uh, personally, I would love to discuss that further with all of our panelists and anyone else who they uh, might have in mind. That includes also speakers for the Congress. If you have ideas on those who might be able to join us uh, to speak or to take part in some workshops, um, feel free to contact IPB. I will also add my email uh, to the chat so anyone can message me with any ideas they have on how uh, we can integrate uh, African issues into our World Peace Congress. Thank you. Yeah. I see the hand of Emma. Thank you. I will put my hand down. Um, yeah, I was going to sort of add to what Sean was saying with um, the also at the moment, the, the IPB Youth Network, which is um, what I'm part of, is uh, organizing a series of webinars 
which is discussing these sorts of questions um, and, and specifically one of our goals with that is to bring together people from lots of different areas of the world. So as, as Rainer mentioned, the issue of small arms and light weapons is a problem in Africa, but it's a problem elsewhere as well. So we really focus on trying to build these networks um, through the webinars. So um, the, to, mostly just to say that's happening and a minor plug that our next one will be in February on um, for Black History Month looking at um, at sort of stories of hope and history. So we, we think a lot of the conversations usually focus on the difficult things and the sad things. And we think that there's some really amazing work that's been done by black activists throughout the years to do amazing things for peace and justice in the world. Um, but yeah, so I, um, if uh, if you're interested in hearing more about those, um, I, I mean, Sean will have all the details as well, but I will just chuck my email in the chat or if you'd like to talk more about that, we'll be doing a series of webinars throughout the year, which is really focusing on bringing, building these international connections um, and, and making sure that the regional discussions happen with people um, sort of from, from everywhere as well. So just to plug in. Yeah, the floor is to you. Just a quick, 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 quick point. Um, I remember a speech, I think by, um, by uh, Martin Luther King given at his Nobel acceptance speech where he linked racism, militarism and colonism. I think uh, in today's world of what we're seeing uh, all over, we are seeing these uh, deepening and which in a very tragic way. So I think as we do work on looking at demilitarization, you know, looking at all of this, I think we should put the element of racism too because it's really high in, the, in India, we had to start this work. Indigenous people had to start when India denied the existence of racism in the world's largest democracy. So I think we will have to bring this element. The other element is, as I wrote in the chat, we, we should be very careful to use language. Terrorism is a term which United Nations have not even defined. And then again, the way it has been misused by nation states is in a, such a, in that way that Nelson Mandela till 2003 United States government designated him as a terrorist. So I think just, uh, uh, Raina, this is to you. When we formulate our IPB family plans, I think we should be very careful that the language that we use is what it is, it literally indigenous to us as what we feel the way Cyril said, what is development? When there are no roads and they are putting money for it, there are no schools, this is sure way of corruption. So I think a really, really brilliant points today. And I just wanted to add these two footnotes uh, and to, to say I'm with everyone in this journey together. Yeah. Right now. Philip, please. Yeah, hello everybody. I'd like to thank all uh, participants from Africa for their, for their contributions today. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Reiner and the team at the IPB is ready to build and build and build our presence in, uh, in Mother Africa. I would like to explore the linkages between the labor movement and civil society. There is a, an infrastructure of unions in Africa. Many of, we know that there's a great deal of union pluralism uh, in, the, in many of those nations, but nevertheless, there, there has been a struggle for uh, an important struggle to gain recognition for the labor movement. So there may be there may be some possibilities for us to, to build on this. I have a question for the four, and that concerns Nigeria. Uh, Mother Africa, um, well, I like to refer to Mother Africa. For the other continents, please forgive me, but I like to refer to Mother Africa. This will have the, this is the fastest growing demographic trend in Africa is amongst young people. And it will make up the largest constituent of young people on the population of the planet. And I want to link back to Nigeria. We saw with the Leki massacre last October uh, and the end SARS movement in Nigeria has been, has been spearheaded by young people, by musicians, by artists, by uh, uh, and uh, youth groups. So I'm just hoping that in this uh, outreach that we are making, that we, that we include Nigeria. And I'd like to get the, the, the reflections of uh, our four panelists about how they view the protest in Nigeria um, 
and and whether that has inspired similar kind of of actions uh, in your own in your own uh, countries if we can tap into that youth voice thank you emma i think it would be very important um i have to say i have to declare a personal interest here because i am uh, i am the uh, uh closely connected to uh the kuti family in nigeria uh, he has been subject to, he's uh, the son of uh, Fela Kuti, the, the, the founder of the Afrobeat. And I've been very worried for him because he's put his, himself on the line and his community on the line in standing up against the Nigerian government. And um, perhaps there's some connections I could build there for the IUP with our youth group in, in Nigeria. But it'd be good to get the reactions of our colleagues from uh, from from Africa on how they viewed the uh, evolution of the situation in Nigeria to get some feedback from them. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, because you have not introduced yourself. I will do it in one sentence. This, is, this was Philip Jennings, one of the two <laughs> IPB presidents. And I think he opened the floor for the final round. And I will give now the word to our forum. African speakers for a short summarizing at the end, and then I will say at, at the final end two sentences of goodbye, and I have to inform you about one more big event. But first of all, our African speakers, and I think we go now again vice versa, and we start with Cyril. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, just one or two words on uh, war protects and war and uh, self protects in Nigeria. In my in my in my side, I really I shared all pictures and uh, uh, videos on the protest in Nigeria because I think that we can learn something about. Uh, uh, what the protests in Nigeria, because we realize that in our country in Cameroon, um, you know that Nigeria is different from Cameroon because in Nigeria they say there's a small, a small amelioration concerning democracy. It's like people think that they can sometimes speak loudly and the uh, uh, government can hear about them. But in Cameroon, we are really far back concerning uh, freedom of expression. Repression is very high. So when we say something like this, we just share, we talk about that so that we can start uh, uh, create awareness on people. So this can happen. We, we can ask what we want, but we have a long way to do because now uh, from what is happening, they are really work on divided more and more people. So you can't speak with order in confidence now because uh, while we are, we are working on awareness, who it is, it is, it is you want to, 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 to keep their place and their power they are doing the, 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 the work in another sense, uh, 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 sense. So they try to divide. Now they are using tribalism. They are using uh, complo, the, 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 the story of complo against people, against this, against your, uh, so yes, we need also to, to, to talk about all of this, but I think that this was a very, very uh, good meeting for me. I really uh, share, but really, Rena, this question of development, this money, I don't know what they are doing. Last time I was in the Bank Mondial for a meeting, this, uh, the, so, so now they're having this thing to, you know, to show that they are consulting people, even civil society, I asked them, why are you call us here to say what? You give money, you say that it's a huh? certain debt. Yes. You don't follow what you are giving. You say that money is for that. When you go there, there's no route. Tomorrow, you're still giving money. Are you sure that you are talking about human being? 
Uh, since they I don't, I didn't receive any invitation <laughs> to participate in the constitution <laughs> in, their, in their thing. Really, um, uh, yes, I'm okay. So please don't don't make us waste time. Maybe, maybe you have other 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 results, other thing you are, you are finding, but really change. So thank you very much. Thank you all of us for this work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the next one is Kwaku. Where is Kwaku? Uh, just to say thank you for the for the event and keep on doing more for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kwaku, for joining us, and we will definitely be in touch. Innocent, yes. the floor is to you. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Rene and uh, colleagues. Thank you so much, sir. We had the good uh, discussions. Uh, but I can uh, recommend that, yeah, to to consolidate, to have a network, IPBS family. Uh, if there is a need to support already partners, existing partners like Rwanda, Cameroon, uh, Sierra Leone, to be supported to establish or to identify potential civil society partners who can join the family. This is a, can be good again to even to start small discussions on the on the, the issues when we will be in a, let's say in, in a Barcelona conference we can even have a, a, a joint or common understanding from different people how they understand and even the strategies so you can think on it again there is a need to show people what is happening here in africa some people they don't know so we have a role and a responsibility to to show people through this this network but in a few words thank you uh, it's a learning discussion let's having it maybe quarterly or Maybe plan it. It's a very, very, very uh, inspiring discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Innocent. And Joseph is the final speaker. Joseph, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Mr. Arena. I think this is a very good platform. And I am so honored for Mr. Arena and the team, the entire team, we highly appreciate the good works you are doing for the entire world at large, including Mother Africa. And my in Africa, as well, thank you so, so, so much for the consent. Uh, it's a clear indication that we want to live in a serene atmosphere when it comes to Africa. And uh, I'll try to link up with you so we all see how best we can partner each other and support each other in terms of ideas to augment the course. However, we must all the time consider the lives of humanity in all forms of aggressions. If we don't put the life of humanity ahead of all forms of aggressions, then all what we are doing is meaningless. We must know and see exactly when to attack issues, when to approach issues. And by so doing, we'll have our peace here in Africa. Racism, discrimination, and marginalization is not going to help at all. It's not going to help. It will rather derail our peace process. So let's all look at all these issues and going forward, we shall get there and have our sustainable peace in Africa. Zerina, I thank you so much for this opportunity. So my thanks goes to all of our four African speaker. It was really and very, very helpful for the developing of our African network, of our future work. And I hope that we will continue working and developing the next steps, the next activities, maybe even starting developing some kind of papers. So I think we should connect each other during the next weeks. And I, quite sure that my colleague Eskil will again take the lead and invite to a small discussion between us and then developing 
the next for me public webinar where we are continue our discussions about Africa. You are heavily invited to think about your participation and your ideas for the Barcelona Congress. And hopefully it is also a good gathering of African people which could come to Barcelona. At the end, you know, it is such a bad time with the Corona issues and all these wars in the world that I'm happy at the end to invite you to a peaceful party where we are celebrating one of the biggest success of the peace movement of the last years, the coming to power of the TPNW, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. IPB is organizing at that day, the 22nd of January, a, a party, a celebration for this treaty. And I would like to invite all of you to join. Maybe you can convince some of your colleagues to join this party with you. My colleague Julia, who is taking lead for the party, is putting the exact uh, detail address uh, in the chat so you can see it. And I hope I will see at the party and during our next events, your faces and hopefully even more faces from Mother Africa. Thank you so much for taking part of this webinar. I wish you all a good afternoon, a good evening, all Joseph a good morning. and. See and hear you again. Goodbye and all the best. Thank you. Bye.